glad you're in church today, this afternoon, all right? Let's start with uh, page 357 on our regular hymnal. How about this one? Leaning on the everlasting arms, the arms of Jesus. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed this with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. I believe you can be seated. The choir will sing.
You ever thought of yourself as royalty? You are. You are. Amen. You're related to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Heir and join heir with him. How about that? Man, do something. All right. It's Christmas. Let's sing a Christmas song. How about that? Page 289 on our All-American. If you have a hymnal, if not, it should be up there. How about, oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. For the Lord is come. Amen. Ooh. Oh, come, oh, ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye, to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen. All right, as you find your way back to your seat, as you notice, there is the box right here in front for the uh, happy birthday Jesus offering that we put out every every year. So it's open. I think we'll have it here until the end of the year. And as you know, we don't have uh, ushers to receive the offering on Sunday night. So if you, if you have anything, uh, please put it on the box back there, and uh, I'll be sure to Take it where it belongs. All right. Let's go to that second verse. Second verse of O Come, O Ye Faithful. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. O sing ye, O bride, host of heaven above. Glory to God, O glory in the highest. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be all glory. 
we give. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Amen. Come, all you faithful. All righty, I just have a few announcements for you tonight, and then we'll have a special for you. Um, don't forget about our happy birthday Jesus offering that we've got going throughout the month of December. If you'd like to give back to the Lord in a special way, uh, of course, every December pastor has this for our church. Um, just goes towards certain expenses and things of the church that happen in December. If you'd like to give back uh, at the end of the year offering, uh, you're more than welcome to the boxes up here. You can place it in there. You can place it in the back if you'd like to designate it. Um, happy birthday, Jesus. I'm sure Pastor will have more to say to you about that. We don't know when Jesus was born, right? Uh, but we do know that he was born. Right? He was born. He had a birthday. And, and we celebrate our birthday, and so why not celebrate his? Okay? The Savior of the world. And he was born of a virgin. None of us have that uh, background. <laughs> None of us have that. All right. So come on out and, and support that if you can. Also, don't forget, um, December 11th, we're having our ladies and men's uh, Bible study out here in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, if you can make it out to that, um, we always have a good time with that. I don't know if anyone else has that testimony, but uh, I just absolutely love that time. Together, we get the men together in the gymnasium, the ladies in the fellowship hall. We eat food first, and then we open up the Bible and study it together. And so December 17th, don't forget about our cantata and uh, the Christmas dinner that will be following the morning service. Uh, we're going to have a potluck, and there's $15 uh, gift drawing which is optional. You don't have to bring that, but uh, that's some sort of gift drawing. I'm sure Miss Sherry could give you more details on that. There's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. Uh, if you'd like to partake and be a part of uh, that and bring some food with you, amen? All right, bring some food with you. We all like food, so bring some food with you and sign it up. Uh, the sign-up sheet's out there in the lobby. You can sign up for that. December 20th, the Borough Bible Club uh, will be having a Christmas party at 6 o'clock p.m. Brother Alex, is there anything else that I need to mention on that? Okay. Okay, great. So be here for that December 20th. If you've got kids that'd be interested, make sure you get them signed up and, and prepared for that. Okay. All right. Brother Ruben, he's going to come and sing for us tonight. Do you have a piano player, brother? No piano player. Okay. Come on up. He's my orchestra. Amen. I've sung this song before and I'm going to attempt to sing it again. Some people like it that I sing the second verse in Spanish. So. If I break speaking in tongues, th that's what I'm doing, okay? It's real These are real tongues, yeah. These are no known tongues, not unknown tongues, all right? Title of the song is One Day at a Time. Amen. I'm only human. I'm just a man Help me believe In what I could be In all that I am Show me the stairway I have to climb Lord, for my sake Teach me today one day at a time One day at a time Sweet Jesus That's all I'm asking from you Tell me today To do everything That I have to do Yesterday's gone and tomorrow may never come. Help me today, show me the way one day at a time. Oh, ya viviste entre los hombres.
Sabe, Señor, que todo está peor, es mucho el dolor. Hay mucho egoísmo y mucha maldad. Señor, por mi bien, yo quiero vivir un día a un día a la vez, Dios mío, es lo que pido de ti. Dame la fuerza para vivir un día a la vez. Ayer ya pasó, Dios mío. Mañana quizás no vendrá. Ayúdame hoy, yo quiero vivir un día. Help me today, show me the way one day. All right. Hey, Amen. Thank you, brother. That was good. You promised you weren't cussing at us or anything? Okay. Yeah. All right. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. <laughs> Pastor asked me to, uh, let's see, it's been probably since... I'd say Thursday that pastor told me he wasn't feeling too well and to start getting ready, start preparing. And um, this was honestly the message that God began, was already working, stirring in my heart. I wanted to prepare this message, um, but it, it's taken me some time. And so I didn't preach it this morning. I still was working on it this afternoon. Um, I preached uh, the message I preached this morning. Um, but I pray that's a blessing to you. It's it's been a, It's been a help to me. And uh, always remember that, Every preacher gets the message first. So God speaks to him first. God gets on him first and uh, deals with him first. Then he brings the message to you. So God's dealt with me in this, and uh, I pray that uh, he'll help you with it as well. So uh, 1 Kings chapter number 18, and I want us to look at verses 21 through 24. And if you found your place in an honor to the word of God, if you're able to, would you please stand? Okay. Would you please stand uh, tonight? And Brother Tim, would you mind turning me up some there, brother? Or am I all the way up? I'm all the way up. Okay, there's something going on with the with, with the speakers. We don't really know exactly what it is. Would it be better if I went back to this? Are you guys okay? Okay, all right, I'll try to shout. I'm a pretty loud guy, so I'll try to shout and get nice and loud on you. First Kings chapter number 18, and we're going to read verses 21 through 24. The Bible says, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? That's a good question to underline in your Bible. If you've got a pen, you'd like to underline something. It's a good one. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, little g, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. I love that statement. When I read that in scripture, I stopped for a minute and pondered. Let him be God. Let God be God. And it says, and all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. It is well spoken. You can be seated tonight. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you once again for opening up your word, Father. We pray you speak to us. I pray. Lord, that you'd hide me behind your cross, Father. I pray that uh, I wouldn't speak anything that is outside of your will and what you would want me to say. So, Father, I pray 
that you would work through me and into the lives of the people, your people here. And uh, Father, pray for our pastor as he's away. Lord, even now I pray that you would place your hand on him and heal him, Lord, and bring him back to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let God be God. That's the title of this message. Let God be God. And uh, in order for us to understand this passage of Scripture, I want us to understand the context here. Uh, we may not all be familiar with this story, and that's fine. One thing, when I, when my wife and I first started going to church, I need to, I can't, I'll try. Uh, one of the things that my, my wife and I uh, were a bit frustrated about when we first started going to church was that uh, it, oftentimes when the preacher would preach, he was preaching to a seasoned congregation. And what I mean by that is they knew their Bibles. I mean, most of them grew up in Sunday school. Uh, most of them have been in church their whole life. And we're these new people kind of from the world, if you will. We're coming in, and most of the sermons were way over our head. And so we'd have to go home and be like, man, what was he talking about? Let's go study it ourselves. In a way, it was good because we went home, we studied it to understand what he was saying. Uh, but I always try uh, in my preaching to put the sermon on the bottom shelf so that everyone can reach it. Uh, that's what I've learned from, from different preachers. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he always said that. He always said, put your sermon on the bottom shelf. You don't need to be a theologian, Ph.D., all the way at the top. And I have the tendency to try to bring my message up like that, but I try my hardest to bring the message down to the bottom. So I want you to understand the context of where we're at. I don't want you to be confused, okay? So King David has unified the nation of Israel into a kingdom in the books of First and Second Samuel. Okay, those are the two books prior to First and Second Kings. And uh, God promised that from his line would come a messianic king or the Messiah. Uh, the books of First and Second Kings detail the many kings that took the throne after King David. The beginning of the book deals with Solomon's reign and the construction of the first temple. Something's changed back there. That sounds good. The construction of the first temple. And the book ends with Jerusalem's destruction and exile to Babylon. Okay, follow along with me. King Solomon, after successfully constructing the first temple, begins making one bad decision after another. Many of you are familiar with that. Uh, he begins marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, by the way, and uh, this was for political alliances, then adopted their gods and introduces or allows for the worship of those gods there in Israel, in Jerusalem. Solomon accumulates tremendous amounts of wealth, amasses a mighty army, institutes slave labor, and creates a mighty empire unto himself. He did not follow in, fo in his father's David's footsteps, or in his instructions even. He went off and did his own thing. And now Israel is headed for destruction. And as the saying goes, what parents do in moderation, children will do in excess. Anyone ever heard that? What parents do in moderation, children will do in, in success. If the parents are missing a little church, chances are the children are going to miss a lot more church when they're older. And if they're missing a lot more church, their children are really probably not going to be in church at all. And so that's why as parents, and this is something I, I try to, my wife and I, we try to maintain, we're not the best, of course, but we try to always set the bar as high as we can. Take the high road. And sometimes maybe that comes off as being strict parents, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to f figure out that line. But you want to be the one that sets the standard high. Because you know that the next generation usually, if you study scripture, usually the next generation slips a little bit. And then the generation after that slips a whole lot. And then the, the next generation is probably not even close to God. In fact, when you study Israel, that happens over and over again. The next generation rises up. There's one instance where it says they didn't even know God. What a sad story. That's, how, that's what happens to churches. The next generation rises up. They don't know God. They've compromised. They've given in. Something's happened, and, and they're not actually worshiping anymore the true and living God. Now, there is an exception to that rule. It's called revival. It's when God steps in. And revival can happen in a church just as much as it can happen in an individual's life. If uh, Alex is deciding that he's going to start slipping and not coming to church again, God can get a hold of him. He could be the next generation, and he could get right, and he, 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 could, he could be the change that affects his 
future in future generations. Now, King Solomon dies, and his son, Rehoboam, continues to make things worse in Jerusalem. His son is now making things worse. Under his leadership, there is a great split. Israel becomes what is called the northern kingdom, and Judah becomes what is called the southern kingdom. Everyone follow along with me? we got father, son, and grandson now. Grandson's the king now. And now there's a split. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Israel is in a bad place. The, God's people are in a really bad place. They're split right down the center. This happens in churches. They get split right down the center. One goes this way, the other one goes this way. This is what happened. Israel is that northern kingdom, and Judah is the southern kingdom. Now, First and Second Kings is a true story with a tragic ending. In chapter number 18, we see the mighty hand of God working through the uncompromising prophet in the northern kingdom under the kingship of Ahab. In his name, that prophet's name is Elijah. How many of you are familiar with Elijah? A little bit? Elijah is a wonderful prophet. He, he's an example of an uncompromising person. Someone who stands firm. Someone who doesn't run away when things get tough. Someone who stays in the fire. And so I want you to understand some of the characters that are playing in this story, and we'll get to the, the message here in a minute. First, you have King Ahab in chapter 18. He's the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel who, married, who was married to the famous Jezebel. I hate saying that name. Jezebel. No one wants to be a Jezebel. Jezebel is the picture of a terrible wife. King Ahab, under the influence of his wife, instituted the worship of Baal, which is the god of fertility and rain. Among her worst acts, she violently purged God's prophets from Israel. She hated God's prophets. Later, she was thrown from a window to her death and trampled by a horse for the evil things she had done. That's Jezebel. So you have King Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel's running the show. Now you have Obadiah. Uh, this, uh, King Ahab had a man by the name of Obadiah who was the governor of his house. Obadiah is, is sort of a hidden prophet. Somehow he was able to escape the wrath of Jezebel as a prophet unto Ahab, but Obadiah was able to secretly hide, listen to this, he was able to secretly hide 100 of God's prophets in a cave from Jezebel. These are prophets that Jezebel wanted gone, annihilated, wiped out. And Obadiah was able to secretly hide these prophets from Jezebel in a cave. Last time I checked, prophets are not supposed to hide. They're supposed to stand out. They're supposed to stand up. They're supposed to preach when things get hard. But they're hiding in a cave. And then you have Elijah. Elijah is sort of the hero of the story, if you will. He's believed to be the only prophet left along with Obadiah. Or perhaps he, he, he viewed himself as the only prophet left who had not compromised while all, all other, others ran for their lives and hid in caves. In chapter 18, we're faced with a dilemma. King Ahab and Jezebel instituted the worship of Baal, the, the false god of fertility and rain. And guess what's happening? Now it's not raining. Isn't it funny how God does that? Uh, uh, King Ahab and Jezebel, they instituted the worship of a false god, Baal. And as soon as they started doing that, it stopped raining. Now, Baal is, is the god of rain. Why is it that when they started worshiping the god of rain, it wasn't raining anymore? Because they were worshiping a false god. That's why. And as soon as they instituted that, it stopped raining. The false god they believe is in charge of the rain is not in charge of the rain. And so the true god of the rain decided he was going to shut the rain off from heaven. I just love that. God had had enough. I don't know if you remember this morning, I said God reached a point where he's just had enough. He's sick. He's tired of it. God can get sick. God can get disgusted. God can get angry. Sometimes we get the wrong understanding. This morning I talked about how God is love, and that's true. But I want you to know something. God can be angry. God hates sin. Uh, one of the greatest sermons ever preached was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If you ever get a chance to go read it, go read it. 
It's a wonderful sermon. God definitely gets, gets, gets angry. A word comes to Elijah in verse 1. So now you have some context. I want you to look with me at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, What? Go. He was given a command. God told him, It's time for you to go. You've got a job. We've got something to do. And me and you, we're going to get this done together. He said, Elijah, I need you to go. Show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. God told Ahab to go, and if he would do so, God would send the rain. And so I've got to tell you about another thing that happens in this chapter before we get into the message. There's a competition that takes place. Uh, uh, Elijah responds to God after he receives that word from God to go. And he goes there, and he, and he starts a competition with the prophets of Baal. He starts a competition with them. And, and I want you to notice uh, here in a second the, how the competition takes place and what he says. Now, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest. Uh, him alone versus 450 false prophets, I call them. He said, let's, go, uh, let's get us two bullocks, and I'll let you choose which one you want, he told them. He said, and I'll take mine, and I'll put it on some wood, and you take yours, you put it on some wood, and don't put any fire underneath it, and then you call upon the name of your gods, your false gods, and if he brings, if your gods bring down fire from heaven and light that fire, let your God be God. But he says, if my God lights my fire, let him be God. He's God. And the competition takes place. The competition takes place. Look at me real quick at our text verse, verse number 24. It says, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Elijah was a man, uh, we might say, learn to let God be God. You know, he wasn't a perfect man. But one thing we know for sure is that he learned to let God be God. And sometimes we need this lesson in our lives. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. How if I'm not careful, I'm trying to be God for my wife. And I've got a problem with something she's doing, and I want to be God for her, and I want, to, I, want to, I want to take the Bible to her and tell her, hey, this is what the Bible says, you're supposed to be doing this. And guess what? She does it to me too, so don't, don't throw rocks at me now, okay? But if we're not careful, we're trying to be God over other people. We're trying to be God, and, and really what we need to do and the best thing that we can do always in every circumstance is to let God be God. Hey, let him do what he's good at. Don't worry about what, what his job is. Worry about what your job is and let God be God. Elijah was a man that learned how to let God be God. In this entire story, Elijah did just that. He wasn't halted by two opinions with one foot in idolatry and one foot in God's will. I want you to look with me at verse 21. It says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? This is the problem with most churches in America. Right here. I'm telling you, it is. One of the reasons why churches in America don't see the power of God anymore is because they've got one foot in the world and another foot in God's church. They're, they're, they've, got, they've got people that are trying to go back to the world and the things that the world offers, but then on the side over here, they've got their church that they go to from time to time on Sunday morning, and hey, we don't need to make church a big deal. We don't need to take it seriously. It's just sort of a side thing. It's just kind of part of our life. Can I tell you something? Go say that to the first century Christians. They would have laughed at you. Church, Christianity, their church family was their whole life. It was everything to them. When, when, when they got saved and when they went down to the river and got baptized, they made a commitment to God that said, I'm going to live for you for the rest of my life. And that doesn't mean they were all perfect. But I am saying this. In today's day and age, the church has more influence or less influence over the world, and the world has more influence over the church. 
and it should be the opposite. And, and, and here we have Elijah saying, how long halt you between two opinions? If you're going to serve the world, just go and do it. If not, let God be God and let's serve God. Let's do what God tells us to do. And so number one, I want us to let God be God when you're the only one left. Let God be God when you are the only one left. I want you to look at verse 22. It says, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He said, I am the only one that remains. The other prophets, instead of standing for God against Jezebel, they gave in and ran to a cave. Sometimes the ministry is very lonely. You might think, I'm the only one left. What's the point? Why continue when, when I'm the only one standing, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about you uh, standing, coming to church, and looking around you and saying, wow, the pews are empty. Where have the people gone? Some of those people may be your friends or your relatives or, or, or your children, whoever it may be, and you're thinking to yourself, what's the point? What's the use? I'm the only one left. Elijah felt that way. He knew that he was the only one left. He was the only one that hadn't compromised. And he still let God be God. Everyone else jumped ship. Everyone else threw in the towel. Everyone else quit. This world's prophets uh, are more in number than the true prophets of God. I want you to think for a second about these prophets that Baal had. Do you think we have those today in our day? They may not be worshiping Baal, you know. It's the same thing with these holidays that we celebrate. Think about Christ Christmas. Do you think the world is celebrating Christmas for Jesus? No. 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 It's full of pagan worship. Full of it. It's full of it. What are you celebrating Christmas for? What are you uh, uh, putting a Christmas tree in your house for? What are you hanging Christmas lights on your house for? What's the reason? Is it just because you want to follow and do everything that the Lord is doing? Or do you have a reason for it? And I want to tell you something. We need to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church of the true and living God. How long halt you between two opinions? Make sure what you're doing is pleasing unto the Lord. We need to understand there's a difference between foretelling and foretelling prophets. Uh, all foretelling prophets are no longer. And what I mean by that is foretelling prophets are prophets that we learn about in the Old Testament. The Old Testament had both foretelling prophets and foretelling prophets. What that means is a foretelling prophet was someone who could foretell of the future. And they would write it down. Their job was to, was to talk about future events as God revealed it to them. And then there are forth-telling prophets. These are prophets that just took the word of God and preached it, essentially. They were the preachers. Today, we still have forth-telling prophets. Don't let, it, don't let anyone come to you and tell you that they're a, a, a prophet, a foretelling prophet, that they've got some idea of a future event or a future thing. It's not true, and they're a false prophet. <laughs> but we do have preachers today. And the preachers by the hundreds, by the thousands, are going the way of Cain, and they're compromising, and they're running to the cave because they're too afraid to preach against this current evil world. It's sad that the people that should be standing for the truths of God's word are not. Instead, they're giving in to these, these lukewarm, soft, uh, cushy messages that lift people up and, and make them feel good. Hey, I'm for a motivational speech. I love them. They're good. But not behind the pulpit. This pulpit is God's pulpit. This pulpit is where the word of God should be preached and proclaimed. Unco no, 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 uh, no compromising on that. Christ is to have the preeminence in all that is said and done in the church service. It is easy in ministry to get discouraged. I'm, I want you to think about Elijah. He said, here I am, I'm the only one left. All the other ones ran away. And I want you to know something. I don't think he got discouraged in this situation. 
But it's very easy in ministry, and it's not just the workers of the ministry. It's anyone who's involved in ministry in any capacity. It's very easy to get discouraged. I remember one of my family's greatest discouragement going to church early on and, and, and praise God for it. I'm glad there was a good sound Bible preaching church there. But one of our greatest discouragements was when we started getting entangled with the discord among the brethren. I wonder if that's why God absolutely hates it. Because it turns newborn babes away from, from, from the faith, from God. And I'll tell you right now, we experienced such discouragement. We would go home and cry because people in the church had problems. It didn't make sense to us. We didn't understand it. Why is it that we go to church, we're excited about being there, we're excited about being fed, we're excited to sing, and then there's problems among the members? God hates it. The, the very people who've been forgiven and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ can't forgive one another. God hates it. There's a lot of discouragement ministry. It happens. And God will use it to strengthen you if you allow it to. It can strengthen you. The ministry can be very lonely. I remember someone telling me that long ago. They said, Brother Mike, are you sure you feel like you're called into the ministry? Are you sure you want to go into the ministry? It is a very lonely place to be. But can I tell you something in the ministry? You, you learn how to be a friend with God. It's not that long. If you learn how to get close to God, if you learn to have a, a solid relationship with the Lord, it's not as lonely as it could be if, if you didn't. I, I've spent hours, Brother Alex, I've spent hours doing things by myself. Because who else is there? The laborers are few. I've spent hours doing things, and this is something we all need to understand. I'm not trying to uh, lift myself up here. I, I'm not. I'm just letting you know that in the ministry, uh, when you're doing the work of the ministry, the laborers are few, and it becomes a very lonely place. You have to do things on your own. You have to walk with God. No one's going to tell you to go read your Bible, Alex. You're going to have to do that on your own. No one's going to tell you to go pray. You've got to do that on your own. You've got to walk with God. And I believe that Elijah was in a place where he saw himself as being very alone. I don't know that he was discouraged, but he saw himself as being very alone. There were quitters and compromisers all around him, and he was the only one left. In the ministry, you deal with the, what I call the Judases or the Jezebels or the Absalom. The Bible is full of rotten characters. And guess what? The church is full of what? Rotten characters. And you could be one of them. You could be one of them. You got to be careful. Because the devil can work in you too. You don't want him to. But guess what? In the ministry, see, here's, here's what I thought. Going in the ministry was going to just be rainbows and butterflies. And I'm going to get to sit on my office chair and read and study the Bible. I love studying the Bible. And it's just going to be this, just, this grand life of just studying the Bible and, and ministering to people and helping them in their life, I didn't realize there was going to be all these challenges. My goodness. Why? Because we're dealing with people. And people have challenges. And people are different. They have personalities. They have backgrounds. They have experiences that other people don't have. And, and Elijah was in this interesting place where he was the only one left standing for God. And God called on him, and he said, I, I'm calling you. You're the man. You need to go to this king, you need to go to this king, and we need to set this straight. And he started this competition. The way of the masses, by the way, is rarely the right way. How many of you have seen these mega churches with thousands of people gathering together? I'm not saying this is always the case, okay? But, for the most part, usually the way of the masses is usually the wrong way. It's not the right way. There's something going on there. There's something amiss. There's something that's not right. If everyone is flocking to it, there's something wrong. God always works through a remnant. Always. All throughout Scripture. Uh, don't think God can't use Fair Havens Independent Baptist Church because we don't have enough people. Hey, God works in remnants. He loves, he delights in working in remnants. In this situation, he's working with Elijah. And an amazing thing happens. Uh, don't think that we can't uh, win souls to Christ because we've only got three or four or five going out soul winning on Saturday morning. And I believe we have more than that, so praise the Lord. We give the Lord credit. 
I think we have anywhere from 8, eight to 10 now. So praise the Lord for that. But don't think God can't work through little things. Hey, little is much when God is in it. Have you guys heard that song? Little is much when God is in it. That little boy, he only had what? Two loaves and five fishes? Five fishes, two loaves? Something like that. Guess what? God used it, split it up, fed thousands. Hey, little is much when God is in it. Romans 11, 4 through 5, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God will always have a remnant. God will always have a remnant. Very rarely is it going to be the big megachurches. He has a remnant. Who are, by the way, these prophets of Baal in our day? Who are these prophets of Baal? Yeah, you may consider them actually false prophets, people who are disguising themselves as Christians, and uh, they're out there. They may just be deceived. You know, I believe there's a lot of good, uh, actually saved preachers out there. They're just leading a flock of dead people, and they don't know it. I believe they're saved. They understand that they got it, but they're not preaching the gospel anymore. They're just giving motivational speeches. People are flocking to it, and they're all dead. None of them have been born again. There's false prophets out there. There's a lot of them. And we've got to be careful. We've got to watch out for them. But I want you to think about it from this perspective. Think about the political leaders of the day. Do you think they're promoting the God of heaven, or do you think they're promoting false gods? I think they're promoting false gods, a lot of them. How about Nancy Pelosi? I better be careful, right? How about, how about Hillary Clinton? How about, how about uh, uh, I, I hate this name, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Hey, I'm at the point, I'm done. I mean, if other preachers aren't going to speak up about it, someone's got to say something. This is getting out of control. The things that are happening, uh, not just in our country, but in the world. And preachers are cowering and hiding and not saying anything about it. I thank God we have a preacher that's still standing in the Word of God. He's still standing upon the truths of the Word of God. But not every preacher is doing that out there. They're not doing that. How about the celebrities of the day? Lady Gaga, Oprah Winfrey, Kim Kardashian, Ozzy Osbourne. I want you to know all of those people, all those names I just mentioned, they all have stated that they sold their souls to the devil. All of them. They're open about it. They're against God. They hate God. But they're influencing our children like you wouldn't believe. Why do we continue to fund them? Why do we continue to give them recognition? How about the leaders of different movements and activists and so on? If you look with me at verse, back at verse 19, I want you to notice this. It wasn't just these 450 prophets. There was another category of prophets. Look at verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450. There's the 450. And the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So you have the prophets of Baal, and then you have the prophets of the grove. Interesting. Who are these prophets of the groves? They were eating at Jezebel's table. These were Jezebel's disciples. These were the ones that Jezebel was influencing. And I always found it interesting, back home for whatever reason, there was a, a community church that popped up, and they called themselves the Grove Church. And I thought, what a terrible name to name your church. I mean, just tell us right off the bat that you're a bunch of false prophets. It's a terrible name to name a church. But that's on them. I mean, that's, that's between them and the Lord, right? <laughs> But they named their church the Grove Church. These were false prophets. They were eating at Jezebel's table. And, 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 and Elijah was saying, hey, bring them all in. I'm going to show them the real God. While they're playing around with all their false gods and trying to get God to do something, it's not raining anymore. Let me show you the real God, the God that can bless, the God that can do great things. The king's wife, Jezebel, led much of this compromise and turning from God. She was cunning and able to draw a crowd. She led people away from God. And I want to say this, be careful who you follow. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever you call it, be careful. Be careful. 
Because false prophets always come in sheep's clothing. And if you're not wise in the scriptures, if you're not seriously wise in the scriptures, they'll sweep you off your feet. They'll begin teaching you something. I'll tell you this. Examine me. Go back to the Word of God. Always go back to the Word of God. That's why the Bible said it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. It's your job to study. If I stand up here and say something that's wrong, I'm wrong. But so are you because you haven't done anything about it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. When my, wife, when my family moves to Nashville, we know that we're going to probably be outnumbered. But you know what our plan is? It's pretty simple. Just let God be God. We're going to let God be God. I have no idea what's going to happen. Nashville is full of, of country music artists. They're everywhere. We're going to be outnumbered. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But you know what? Our only job is to let God be God. We're going to let God be God. We're going to let him do what he does best. Number two, let God be God when the world around you rages. Look at me at verse 28. Look at me at verse 28. Let, let God be God when the world around you rages. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. So what happened in this competition? These prophets of Baal, these false prophets, begin dancing around and doing their dancing. They're calling upon the name of their God. They're doing whatever it takes to, to get their gods to light this fire, and nothing is happening. Nothing's happening. And now they're getting angry. Now they're getting frustrated. So they're starting to cut themselves. And blood is gushing out everywhere. And Elijah is watching from a distance. I don't know how far away he is from them, but he's watching. And we're going to learn about what they do. These, 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 these prophets were just spinning their wheels. Scientists who reject God are examining and discovering God's beautiful creation without giving recognition to the author of it. That's what they're doing. All of these fields of science, unless they're creation scientists, which I have a, a great deal of respect for creation scientists, but uh, unless, unless they're creation scientists, all they're doing is spinning their wheels. The vast majority of them don't believe in God at all. They're atheists. And so they're examining God's creation, trying to find an explanation for life without giving the correct and proper respect to the one who actually created it. They're spinning their wheel. And a lot of scientists go mad. They go crazy. I want you to look at some of these philosophers and the way that they die. Most philosophers end up going wacky, new, wacky, I don't know what, how you say it, wacky new new. They end up going crazy. Because they're trying to figure out life. They're trying to figure out and explain life. They answer some of the silliest questions. What is true? Or what's real? What can we know to be true? Hey, guess what? If you had the word of God, you would know what truth is. They end up spending their will. A lot of them commit suicide. They die from other reasons. Heroclitus died covered in dung after falling, uh, falling to cure, failing to cure himself from dropsy. I don't know what the deal is with that. Zeno was tortured and killed by the tyrant Nearchus after biting off the tyrant's ear. It's a weird one. Empedocles, I don't know how to say all these philosopher names, leaped to his death into the crater of Etna. Socrates, or Socrates, drank a poison called hemlock. Is Socrates starved himself to death? These are just instances of people who, who have just rejected God. These are not dumb people. They're very smart, intelligent people. They've just missed it. And that's exactly who the people that Elijah is dealing with. He's dealing with people that have completely missed it. They're gone. It's not that they're dumb. It's that they've just missed the real, the true and living God. They've completely missed it. This world is, is so full of confusion. Think about the, I think about these children that are cutting themselves. How many of you have ever heard of that? Yeah, it, it's, it's quite strange self-inflicting harm upon themselves. Uh, the depression is sweeping through our youth at, at alarming rates. Children and teens committing suicide. That, 
you know, that was something that was completely unheard of. To my knowledge, in the 50s, 60s, a, a, a young person killing themselves, they've got their whole life before them. I wonder what's changed. I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that people aren't going to church anymore. I wonder if the crime rate that's going up has anything to do with the fact that less and less people are going to church. I bet you it does. I bet you it has a whole lot to do with it. Children seeking same-sex relationships in elementary school. My goodness. This is the world that we live in. Wickedness prevails to extremes. Uh, I was talking to Brother Bob, and Brother Bob, if you know Brother Bob, he very much keeps up with the times in Israel, the news and everything that's happening in Israel. He was telling me some of the things that Hamas was doing to these Jews that they had captured. Terrible, terrible thing. Uh, uh, they're finding now, they're finding young children with their arms completely missing. What's the point of that? Unless you're demon possessed. Their arms missing. They're finding women with their breasts cut off. And they're finding women who were pregnant where they killed the baby in the womb. That's wicked. That is absolutely wicked. These are the things that are happening in our day today. These are the philosophers. These are, these are, are the prophets of Baal. These are the prophets of our day, the ones who are leading these movements and these, these wicked uh, organizations that are completely against God. Planned Parenthood. The United Nations, we can go on and on, Hamas and terrorist organizations, they're against God. This world around us is going to toss and turn and grumble because they're trying, as Ahab did, to solve the problems of their day without the God who has the solution. If you read the first few verses, we won't have time to get into it, but King Ahab thought he was going to solve this problem of no rain. He got, he, he, he got uh, Ray Bone together, he said, hey, let's go out and gather some water. There's no rain, everything's dying off, let's go out and gather some water. He thought he was going to solve the problem, but he wasn't going to solve the problem. God's in charge of the rain. Think about climate control. You know, climate control is not a big deal if you know the God of the Bible. Hey, it may be that, that uh, temperatures are changing, and the uh, snow caps are melting, and it may be that the ocean is rising uh, one inch every 3,000 years or something crazy, but you know what? I don't care at all. Why? Because I know the God of the Bible. And he doesn't care. And he's in charge and he's in control. Hey, when you understand the God and know the God of the Bible, all these things become so minuscule. Think about abortion. Abortion is no longer even an option if you know the God of the Bible. Homosexuality makes no sense if you know the God of the Bible. Divorce is, is a whole lot harder to comp contemplate if you know the God of the Bible. Think about alcoholism and drug abuse and pornography and murder and anger. Are all these issues are, are, are issues that God, the God of the Bible, can solve. And, and these, these prophets are dancing around their fire and trying to get it lit by their false God. And now they're cutting themselves and they're just driving themselves absolutely crazy. I can imagine what, what Elijah was, was thinking. In fact, he began to mock them, if you remember. He started telling them, oh, well... Uh, your God must be sleeping or something. Oh, he, may, he, he must be running an errand right now or something. Oh, maybe he just doesn't have time for you. You can go read it. It's in there. Not exactly like I'm saying it, but it's in there. He starts mocking them. Hey, where's your God at? I thought your God was going to light your fire. And you say, that's not very Christ-like. Yeah, I'd agree, but Christ hadn't come yet, so. He started mocking them. These people have lost their ever-loving mind. That's the people of this world. Aren't you glad that the true and living God never sleeps, never slumbers, and is interested in everything about you from the smallest thing all the way to the biggest thing? Hey, let God be God even when the world around you rages. Last point. I'm sorry, I've already taken too long. Brother Jim, you're going to have to give me a spanking later or something. All right, last one, number three. Let God be God when God hasn't shown up yet. Let God be God when God hasn't shown up yet. Look with me in verse 33 through 35. The Bible says, And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water 
and pour it on the burnt sacrifices and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. Let God be God, even when God hasn't shown up yet. Elijah was someone who was steadfast. He didn't just quit because God's hand wasn't evident at that moment. He kept pushing forward. He kept pushing towards the mark. And we all need to have this, this characteristic, especially if you're in the ministry. You need to learn how to press toward the mark, to not allow things to, to affect you, not allow things to put you down. You just got to keep trucking. You got to keep pushing. You got to ignore the small stuff and keep going towards the goal, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. Elijah never gives up. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going. Uh, when you think God is not in it, you just keep doing right, and God will show up. How many uh, of you remember um, we had a preacher here not long ago, and he preached a message very, very similar to this. And he was preaching about how, listen, when ministry knocks you down, you just get up and you can start over. You just do it, do it again. Get right back at it. Don't quit. Quit that word. We should go to our dictionaries at home and rip it out of our Bible. I remember a good preacher saying that one time. His name was Jack Hiles. He said, I went home one day after a sermon, and I opened up my dictionary, and I found the word quit, and I just ripped it right out of my dictionary because I don't want that, that word in my vocabulary. Listen, don't quit. If you're in the choir, don't quit. That's not the solution. It's never the solution. If everyone quit, we wouldn't have a church. And guess what? If you quit, it's going to cause someone else to potentially quit. And I'm telling you, don't quit. Even when God hasn't shown up yet, let God be God. Keep going. Keep doing the right thing. The truth is, is that the vast majority of ministry really isn't all that exciting. You think about Elijah telling his servants, telling his men, just keep pouring. Just keep pouring water. Which, by the way, doesn't make any sense, but he's like, just keep pouring water on it. Go back the third time and do it again. And they had to listen. There are days when you're just doing the same thing you did the week prior. Anyone, you ever feel like that, Miss Sherry? In ministry, oh, it's just another week. Doing it again. Doing the same thing. You know, we haven't seen much of God. But, hey, we just got to keep going. We're doing the same thing we did last week. Yeah, I understand, but we just got to keep going. We just got to keep trucking. We just got to keep doing. We got to keep doing the work of the ministry. That's why my life verse has kept me going. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It will keep you going. The ministry demands steadfastness. Doing the right thing over and over again is faithfulness. Even whenever it doesn't work out for you, it's still faithfulness. Hey, we don't go soul winning uh, for the sake of having fruit. Because some people, when they've got the idea that they go soul winning so that they can get people saved, and then people don't get saved, they quit. We go soul winning because it's faithful to the gospel, the Great Commission, what we've been told to do. If you've got your eyes on the wrong place. If you've got your eyes on God, you'll be obedient to him, and even if no one gets saved, you're still doing the right thing. You're still being faithful. You're still doing right. You're still living for the Lord. That's, by the way, pragmatism. Anyone know what pragmatism is? Pragmatism is this idea that if it produces results, we should do it. Be careful. Be careful because it's not true. I guarantee you if I put out on the Internet that we were going to have a beer and Bible fellowship, we'd get a lot of men to come to church. But just because it works doesn't mean it's right. We're not pragmatists. We're biblicists. We say, hey, if it's in the Bible, that's what we do. I've heard it said by good Bible preachers, if it's Bible, it's Baptist. If it's Baptist, it's Bible. All throughout his history, one of the great things about the Baptist is that we've always said, if it's not in here, I don't want to touch it. If it is in here, I'm living by it. That's what we've always said. We continue to fight over it today. What's actually in here and what's not in here. What's actually in here, what's not in here. We're content. The debates go and they rage. And that's a wonderful thing because we're constantly examining ourselves against the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I love being a Baptist. 
Don't take Baptist off the name. Let God be God when God hasn't shown up yet. If you try and do things in ministry in order to see the hand of God, you are doing things all the wrong reasons, and the truth is you will burn out and quit. But if you do things in ministry because you love the Lord, God will show up and continue to bless you. Don't miss that. I get that out of line a lot. Just being honest with you. I get that out of line a lot. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? It should be because I love the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 14-15, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And I promise you, if Christ is your goal in the Christian life, God is going to bless you. You're going to see his hand. Just keep going. The truth is God isn't always showing up. He's not showing up when I'm cleaning the trash. He's not showing up when I'm uh, cleaning the toilets. Okay, He's not showing up when, when uh, we're doing just the rope mundane things. But God will show up. Stay at it. Stay steadfast. You keep on keeping on. And even when it doesn't make sense, God will show up. Now, I'm at the end. You can close your Bible. Elijah is talking to King Ahab now. And he says, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. What a wonderful thing. Ahab sends one of his servants and says, hey, go out over there to the ledge. There's a sound of abundance of rain. I want you to go out over the edge and look out into the ocean and tell me if you see anything. His servant runs out there. He runs out to the ledge. He looks out of the, over the ocean, and he sees nothing. He's like, okay. So he goes back to Elijah. He says, Elijah, I saw nothing. He says, go back again. Goes back again. He looks. He sees nothing. Goes back, he says, do it seven times. On the seventh time he comes back, he says, I see, I see a cloud out there. There's a cloud. And it looks like a hand. There's a cloud out there. What does the cloud mean? Rain. God is bringing his rain. Hey, what did God promise Elijah at the beginning? He said, if you go, if you go, I will send the rain. And what's great about it is he showed himself as a true living God to all of Israel at that time. What a wonderful thing. Hey, when you're obedient to God, God is going to make himself known through you to the world about you. And I want to say this. Let God be God when you're the only one left, when the world around you rages, and when God hasn't shown up yet. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. And for, Lord, the message that we were given tonight. Father, I pray that you'd help us. Help us to give you more attention. Help us to give you all attention. In every, in every aspect of our lives, Father, I pray that we'd let you be, be God. I, I, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to step off of our throne and allow you to be on the throne in our lives. Allow you to be our king. Allow you to be our Lord. Father, help us in this. Now, every head bowed and every eye is closed. And as the instrument plays, I want you to know the altar is open if you'd like to come down and speak to the Lord. I want to ask you this. How are you doing letting God be God in your life? Are you the God of your own life? Or is God the Lord? Is He God in your life? Maybe you'd like to come down tonight before we go home and have a little talk with Jesus. I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know what the Lord's been working on you about. But maybe something completely unrelated to the message. You'd like to have a little talk with Jesus. The altar's open for you.